today we're going to watch more scenes from Bumblebee and analyze the themes of the film which of course have a lot to do with the automobile. I like this film because it is well made. A well made film for me is one where visual elements carry on the plot or are able to establish the environment of the story, the ambience, not just the environment in a physical, in a material sense, of course. Then this is also a, an entertainment product, right? So it is based on what you would expect from the best Hollywood products, that is to say, repetition, variation, big scenes. There is a lot of repetition in here. There are multiple scenes inside the kitchen, inside the front part of the house, because there are at least four, possibly five mornings where we follow the morning rituals and the moods, the different moods of Charlie and her family. There are several scenes in the garage where Charlie and B-127, Bumblebee, cement their friendship. There are multiple scenes outside of the house, but especially at the beach or near the sea. There are two of them that are significant. Of course, variations are introduced in each scene in terms of what is going on in terms also slightly in terms of camera angles, but you understand that repetitions help carry on a story in a clear way, clear enough for the viewer to follow without having to put too much of an effort into it. At the same time, they're very effective from the point of view of the cost of production, right? Because you set up your equipment you have probably the garage will have been in a studio set and you go through all the scenes that take place there. Then you set up uh, your equipment in the kitchen and you do all the kitchen scenes, etc. The big scenes is what you expect from a big budget movie. So those are the car chases, the fights, uh, the, the flying of the droids, etc. In reference to small details, I'll just indicate to your attention this detail. For example, at the end of the scene that we watched last week, we, um, actually Tuesday, it was supposed to be last week, we saw that B-127 and Charlie managed to scare each other. And they retreat, they step back. Charlie goes back to the door of the garage and she's kind of pinned in a situation that seems suggestive of danger. And B-127 goes back to this corner of the garage, but notice what's next to him in a very visible way once he goes down on his talons. It's Charlie's father's Corvette, right? And this is a clue that is offered to you visually, anticipating a twist, a series of twists in the story, whereby Charlie will find in Bumblebee a kind, a sort of replacement, not for her father, clearly. Bumblebee will not become a father to her, but he will take over the functions his father had in reference to the growth of Charlie's persona, of Charlie m maturing to become an adult, a grown-up, okay? He will be supportive of her the same way that his father, for example, was supportive of her sports activities. Charlie was diving, she stopped diving when her father died. And of course, she will resume diving 
for Bumblebee at the end of the movie to save him. Charlie and her father were working on the car and through her relationship, in an indirect way, through her relationship with Bumblebee, she will find the strength to finally finish the project and at the end of the movie, we'll see her established as a grown-up, secure, confident in herself, driving the Corvette that will be perfectly polished and will we'll be driving, driving through a wooded area <laughs> reminiscent of another scene in the woods that we will see today where Bumblebee reveals himself and his story to Charlie. So the woods can be in several kinds of fiction, fictional narratives, symbolic of the inner world of a character. So visually, without having to say anything, the film is saying a narrative connection, a thematic connection is established between the droid in its humanoid form and the card that represents the bond between Charlie and her father. And in fact, as I said, Charlie, uh, Bumblebee is not replacing her father, but is replacing the bond, the kind of relationship, positive, fertile, that she had with her father at the end of the film, in the conclusion we'll see today, next to the picture of Charlie and her father, and underneath, of course, the Corvette to reinforce the symbolic power, the symbolic value of the old Corvette, next to this picture, which has been shown at least twice before in the film, we now have, just next to it, so almost at the same value, in terms of physical evidence, Charlie and Bumblebee. Notice though that Bumblebee is represented here in its car format, not human humanoid format. So we know that through this kind of frame, we know that the kind of bond she had, the strong bond she had with her father, which made her grow has not been replaced, but she has found another kind of relationship or bond with a similar function to continue with that work, right? Continuation is represented by the car. The car got interrupted when her father died. After she meets Bumblebee, the car, the car is completed. Okay, so we know they're on the same journey. Why not the humanoid format? Anyone, any ideas? What would have been wrong from the narrative standpoint, if we had seen the face of Bumblebee with his big pet-like eyes, what would have been out of sync? Yes? Like it would just take away the nature in the moment, like you just see a really big robot next to the picture, Charlie and her father, you know, it's not really symbolic if he's in the human form as if, if he's in the car form, because that's the connection they share is with the car. Yeah, but maybe you're close to what I was thinking. What I had in mind is you don't want to be blunt in suggesting that there is another human or another person or quasi-person replacing her father, right? So if, if you had put visually the head and the eyes of the droid here, the connection would have been from B-127 to the father. Whereas if you put the car is Father, car, car, B-127. Because it is this kind of process, process of growth, facilitated first by your father, then by Bumblebee, that you want to emphasize, not to say something as ridiculous as, oh, I lost my father, I found the droid, right? Would have been really out of touch with the sensitivity of some of the viewers. Okay, then. Let me introduce the first in a series of scenes. And although this is a block, the central part of the film, I will stop from time to time to uh, introduce the next scene, the themes, or what you should be looking for in terms of visual cues. I'm going to ask you, uh, 
either now during the viewing of the film or later on when you have time to leave a few comments, reactions of your own inside the Google Docs file for participation. If there is time, I will also hear some of those comments, but otherwise all of the comments will be there for me the next time I visit your file uh, to look at. Again, I don't want to spoil your viewing. It doesn't have to be a systematic comment of everything you see, just a few strong reactions or intuitions that you might have in regards to this story and its characters. So you can do it now, you can do it later when you reflect on what you have seen. Now, after Charlie realizes that the car is not just a car, because of the commotion in the garage, her mother will come knocking. So Charlie is about to be discovered. In fact, when her mother enters, Bumblebee turns back into a beetle. So the only thing that is out of the ordinary for her mother is the fact that there is a car and she can very well explain how the old man at the junkyard gave her the car. Now, the mother has a line, which is one of those lines that resonate more than, at, at more than one level. Because the mother sees this very old beetle, dusty, and not, not apparently in, in the best of shapes, and she said, does it run, okay? And that's the issue for both Charlie and B127. That is to say, is Charlie able to function in her life? Because we find her at the beginning of the movie in a state of crisis. So does it run apply to Charlie means, will she turn into a, an adult, into a fulfilled uh, uh, grown up? And for, Ch and for Bumblebee, does it run is, will Bumblebee be able to become a warrior? and accomplish his mission. So you see through this indirect reference that both characters who are about to bomb, Charlie and Bumblebee, have experienced loss, right? Loss of his planet, previous life, the, the social harmony of his planet for Bumblebee, loss of her father, and the balance in his, and the harmony in his family for Charlie because she's not finding her place in the new family with her stepfather and her brother. And both of them have a goal, right? Both of them, one should be able to accomplish the mission, become the hero of his group, become, be recognized as a warrior, Charlie, be recognized by others as someone worthy of respect. We've seen a little bit of that before, right? The theme of respect has been insinuated in the plot because we saw Charlie after being humiliated at the park in front of her schoolmates. She goes to the junkyard and the garage and there it's clear that she has, she can gain the respect of the man working full time in the garage, that she knows at least as much as they do. So this is one part of Charlie that has to be brought out in public, whereby by the end of the movie, she can be assured, confident of her talents, confident of herself. We will see Charlie reflected, a lot of reflections, the eyes reflected by the rear view mirror, mirrors of the cars, of Bumblebee as a car, of the Corvette as a car at the end, or in the glass windows, in the glass of the windows, because this is, when I look at you, do I see you? And when you look at me, do you see me? Do you see my true self? Do you see me for what I am? What am I worth? Uh, and um, in fact, when we have this dialogue between Charlie and Bumblebee initially, Bumblebee will just be able to point at her chest. And finally, she doesn't get it right away, but finally she says, oh, who am I? 
right? And, and that is also, of course, that line has a lot, of le- a lot of levels as well. Who am I means what is my true self, my unrealized self, what is that I can bring into uh, the world. And Charlie will give a name to Bumblebee, right? And the same way that uh, Herbie received a name from Tennessee, Tennessee will find the name, it's the name of an uncle, and Jim will agree. Uh, so notice also, keep in mind what we saw, a lot of similarity, similarities, intentional similarities with Herbie, uh, the Love Bug, and other films in the uh, series. Then at the end of this scene in the garage, we go out into the world with a shot of the moon in the nightly sky because someone else is looking at us. And in this case, it's the other aliens, the other droids who are looking for Bumblebee, who are coming to Earth to destroy Bumblebee and defeat their enemies. These are the evil Decepticons trying to kill all the good Transformers. And then following that, we'll have another morning. So let's proceed with the first two scenes. Do you see the reflection? Because the car is actually sentient and therefore the car is looking at her. And again, from a strictly visual point of view, the visual element carrying a symbolic meaning. The fact that you have this card that turns into a droid, into a humanoid, that you have the outer self of Bumblebee and the inner self of Bumblebee indicates that the same is true for Charlie, who's goofy, frustrated, and happy. That's their her current outer self and her inner self, heroic, strong, will affirm itself through the story of the film. Okay, so the same duality applies to the character. It's not just Bumblebee who transforms, she will transform as well, and that becomes very clear by the end when Bumblebee will transform into his true self, which has been a Chevrolet Camaro, and she will say, what? You could have been that the whole time? Meaning, I could have been seen by others in this cool car instead of a Volkswagen Beetle, right? But it applies to her as well. She could have been this strong, empowered woman the whole time, but she got there only at the end of the film. Of course, they are both scared in public situations, and in confrontations, this is not a real confrontation, but Bumblebee thinks it is. And that's the scene of the arrival of the evil Decepticons who are chasing after B-127 because they've identified the signal from his radio. And this is the third morning we see in the film. She's much more confident than the previous mornings, of course. She almost ignores the family, goes straight for Bumblebee. Hey, where are you? Now you remember that at the beginning of the film, we saw the military in training, they come in contact with B-127, they chase after him, and then they lose him because a Decepticon intervenes and damages uh, B-127. Through the rest of the film, of course, we will see the military again, the character of John Cena, Jack Burns, the CIA, or some other kind of intelligence agency, they will make contact with the Decepticons. The Decepticons will tell them a story, a fake story, how 
B-217 is an enemy to be eliminated, dangerous for themselves as well as humans, and they will play a game with each other. The Decepticons want to gain access to the intelligence system, to the satellite apparatus, to the phone network in order to find where B-127 is and destroy it. The military want the technology that these Decepticons know and that they used to modify the uh, computers of 1987, the year of the film. So they try to deceive each other. They're simulating. So even in this case, there is an outer self made of lies and simulation, an inner self, which is the evil intentions of the military, the evil intentions of the Decepticons. Of course, on the side of the military, by the end, there is a reversal whereby John Cena becomes the good guy and shows his newfound respect for Charlie, for Bumblebee, and helps them escape the government. First scene at the beach, the beach becomes a hideout in this case, where to experiment with yourself. She's transmitted the same fear of others she has, right? People can be terrible to her as well. In here we have the first of two scenes. In the woods, Bumblebee reveals his story and what his mission is supposed to be. In the next, inside the garage, Charlie reveals her inner turmoil, the issues that have appeared in her life following her father's death, and you can guess what Charlie's mission is to become an adult, to grow, to mature, to affirm the true self. That was a scene from The Breakfast Club, mm -hmm. hey, famous movie from the 1980s. In the same way that during the scene in the woods, the background story, where he comes from, where he's going, appears to the viewers from through the holographic 3D video that is projected in the air when Charlie fixes Bumblebee. In here, we'll have another video to perform the same function. It will be a VHS tape of Charlie and her father, with Charlie engaged in her diving sport activity. So we see where she comes from, what her losses are, and then the rest of the scene and the presence of the Corvette will clarify where she is going. You will see at some point a significant <clears throat> passage where we see her eyes in the rear view mirror in, in one of the side mirrors, rather, <clears throat> of the Corvette, because of course, the Corvette is symbolic of her father. Her father saw her for who she was, and, and now she needs someone else to, to have that function in her life. Okay, one. And must be an outsider. See the words of encouragement from the father, she jumps in, and in case you didn't get that he's going to replace her father, he's not going for her kind of music, he wants his father's kind of music. So it becomes clear without saying much what his narrative role is. like saying, do you want to hear my story, the story of me and my father, right? Do you want to enter my world? Starting up the car means starting up her life again. But they now have someone who listens to each other, right? They're now there for each other. They can talk and be heard. Now, even the arrival of Memo, her friend, who's clearly in love with her, signals to the viewers 
that finding your true self, finding reassurance and confidence in a public or a social interaction is one of the key themes to the movie. And this is expressed, for example, by the fact that before Memo enters the garage, he's trying to strengthen himself, to find strength in himself, and he's repeating that he is, in fact, the opposite of what he looks like to the others, a nerd. I'm not a nerd, I'm not a nerd, I'm not a nerd, is what he will be repeating. And of course, in some ways, even Memo will transform from being a regular nerd into being a likable nerd. But clearly, the movie itself will show that his transformation is nothing compared to the transformation of Charlie. And for example, at the very end, when Charlie and Memo walk together outside the house of Charlie, and he reaches for her hand and grabs her hand, she, she does like this and says, oh, no, 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 we're not quite there yet. Because after all, and you'll see it also in the scene of the fight, the final fight, Charlie is at an entirely different level in her growth compared to Memo. Of course, this first ride is a positive experience for both of them. They feel thrilled, they feel empowered by their connection and friendship with this powerful droid. Then, however, they will reach the shores and we have the second scene in a similar setup on the shores because there they will find all the schoolmates, the cool crowd assembled there and exactly the cool guy par excellence in the school will approach Charlie and ask her to dive from the cliff into the ocean. So he's challenging her to be herself because of all the female characters surrounding the cool guy, only she can dive because of her sport experience. So this is one opportunity, the first to affirm her powerful self in front of everyone and gain respect. But it is too early. She will not dive now because it is not significant enough. Why do it for this guy? This guy meant something at the beginning of the movie because she liked him. But by the end of the movie, this guy is nothing and she will dive instead. She will win over her fears to dive and save Bumblebee who's about to drown. And Bumblebee was sacrificing himself to save her in turn. Hey, check out his reflexes. This scene and, and the one that will follow are similar to scenes in Herbie, the long part. This is like Herbie, really, this kind of push. It's straight from that kind of film. The same way that her father was encouraging her before diving, right before jumping from the dive board. Before the scenes, the scene develops, keep in mind when she will decide to back away from this challenge and go back to the car, when she's stepping back from her position in isolation from the crowd near the cliff, back to the, going back to the car, the focus of the camera will make her and the crowd behind her both fuzzy, out of focus. That is to say, she's fading out of the spotlight. She's surrendering this, giving up on this opportunity to be someone, to be seen by others. See, there it is, out of focus, right? Even before she goes back. This is the visual way of telling a story that I was referring to. Be mind what she told B-127, people can be terrible. You have to hide in front of them. Don't expose yourself to the risk of being treated like them. Because of course, Tina's car represents her public self her public identity. 
And if this scene was not Walt Disney-ish enough, you will see how the next scene is reminiscent of the situations in which you find Herbie the love bug because they'll be chased by a police car and Herbie will take over. Herbie will not be driven by Charlie, will take care of the chase in a very fantastic way. And at some point, Herbie will even force them, these two potential lovers, close together in, in a very close uh, proximity that they both, through their walk awkwardness, realize uh, could lead to something. Uh, and after that, you will find a very brief scene of the fourth morning, and the fourth morning is the one where she, Charlie, is the most confident, almost ignoring the family, going straight to the garage for uh, Bumblebee. And that's where we will stop and then look at the conclusion. Can't be more Herbie than this. Herbie actually does that in a tunnel. Herbie goes to the tunnel. It's the final fight. Of course, you've seen how he showed his face to her, lowering his mask before dying, essentially. But, as I said multiple times, she will jump in to save him. In her, he finds the strength to resurrect, come back to the surface. She has found the strength to be herself. And now the outsiders, such as John Cena, will acknowledge both of their vibe, value or mind. Once the outsiders have recognized what she's worth, she'll come back to her family and be recognized by them, be seen differently by them. That's the scene from Breakfast Club, right? The guy in the field. That's why they cannot be together at the end. They're not matched yet. And this is the final goodbye, although there will be an epilogue to follow. Now they both belong to a group, to a community, to a clan, but they're full members, full staffs. And now that he's recovered his strength, he turns into a Camaro because that car represents him and she'll find the Corvette to represent her. So the Beetle represented this transitional state for both. And she goes back to her family, but now she's treated differently. She has a different role altogether, different level of respect around her. The family was closed and she was on the outside before, now she's part of the family. Even her stepfather so acts true. differently. Wow. See, these little moves are, are the nice part of the film. Not a line, just the way he straightened up his chest, right, Otis? Tells a lot. This is the coda for Q127. So he's being recognized as a warrior by his group, by his family. And she completes the Corvette and goes out in style. Now we see the double pictures we saw at the beginning, right, that I showed you. The two father figures, the two mentors. There she is. First we see the car, then we see her, the woods behind her. 